All right, folks, we're continuing with muscle tissue here, and we're going to do uh, muscle contraction and how the whole muscle produces tension and what kinds of tension graphs we see from that. So first of all, this is a resting sarcomere. And remember in a rest, resting sarcomere that this area right here, well, re recall that this area right here from here to here is called the A-band. And it's the A-band because uh, it's mainly the thick filaments and it's the thick in some areas for for example right here to right here it's the thick filaments plus the zone of overlap between thick and thin so it's an anisotropic band or a band that doesn't let light through and then you have an H zone now the H zone is uh, still thick filaments but there's no overlap as of yet anyway so in the resting sarcomere this H zone is pretty wide compared to the contracted sarcomere because the thin filaments haven't encroached upon this area yet and then in the middle of the H zone you have this M line now what's going to happen in a contracted sarcomere is these thin filaments are going to slide towards the center these thin filaments here on the right are going to slide that way and these thin filaments here on the left are going to slide that way and what it does is it decreases the width of the H zone. That's what it does. And by the way, it decreases the the, uh, the length, if you will, of the sarcomere. So the sarcomere gets shorter. Gets shorter. However, none of these myofilaments get shorter. It's the sarcomere gets shorter, but the filaments slide past each other and they don't get shorter. So it's called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. And this is a uh, contracted sarcomere. You can see that the H zone is, is uh, it has less width, I think. Well, it's hard to tell between the pictures. But it's supposed to be showing you the H zone is less width. All right, that's the contracted sarcomere. Now, this shows, this shows it better. If you look right here, if you look right here at the H zone... And then compare it right here to the H zone. Look how look how much shorter the H zone is in the contracted sarcomere versus the resting sarcomere right there. And it's showing us something else in this. What if the muscle isn't hooked to a fixed point? And you're going to say, what do you mean what if the muscle is not hooked to a fixed point? They're always hooked to a fixed point. No, not necessarily. Think of the orbicularis oculi or the orbicularis oris or the uh, hmm, risorius. Think of some of these muscles that hook from skin to skin or muscle to skin. When they shorten, they're going to pull from both ends. If both ends are able to move, they're going to pull from both ends. However, if a muscle is hooked to a fixed point that can't move or doesn't typically move, then when the muscle shortens, it's pulling from whatever's down here. If this is a dumbbell, it's pulling that dumbbell. So what do we have here? Well, we have muscles of both types. We have muscles that hook skin to skin or muscle to skin. And we have muscles that hook... Uh, to a bone, bone to bone, in, in some in a lot of cases, one of the bones is fixed and the other bone is free to move. So we have both of these, and we'll took we'll take a look at both of these when we talk about lever systems. What this is showing you is an optimum length of a muscle contraction, and what I usually do in uh, lecture is. I say, okay, if I was going to jump up and dunk a basketball, which, by the way, I can't do, but if I was going to jump up and dunk a basketball, I wouldn't squat all the way down where where my behind was touching my heels and try to get a maximum vertical leap out of that position. That's too much stretch of my quadricep muscles. In addition, or also, I wouldn't, lock my knees and try to jump up and dunk a basketball so what would i do well i i would squat a little bit and you're going to say well how much is how much is just right well that's all part of athletic conditioning and training and really it's the training part 
So determining where you get the maximum contraction is part of training for that sport. And we do have an optimum length for a maximum tension. So if you look at the y-axis here, the y-axis is tension. And the x-axis is length. And you can see that we have an optimum length right in here. This is maximum, or this is not maximum tension. This is why it's darn close, though, isn't it? Well, maybe it's supposed to be 100%. But if it's not 100%, it's in the 90s. You know, it's definitely up there in the 90s. So this is my optimum length. Some place around two micrometers. That's my optimum length of a of a myofiber stretch, if you will. Now remember, all my muscle organ is thousands to millions of myofibers lined up end to end to end to end. But I'm just looking at one of them. And if I'm too short, then that's like not bending my knees at all when I'm jumping. And if I'm too long, that's like squatting all the way down to the floor when I'm jumping. So you can see there's an optimum length to a maximum tension. And the reason for that, by the way, they show you here. If you're stretched too far, you have hardly any over, uh, overlap between the thick and thin filaments. So if you have hardly any overlap, how are you supposed to make cross bridges and slide the filaments past one another? And then this one shows you you're stretched so far, there's no overlap. There's zero overlap on this one. So obviously you're not going to get any tension produced on that one. Whereas if you're too short, then you you have too much overlap and you've already, in essence, uh, contracted. And think about this. This is when you lock your knees before you try to jump up and dunk a basketball. Well, you just locked your knees. You already contracted your quads. So how can I have a have a good contraction if they're already already contracted? So this is showing you too much overlap. And by the way, this is like, uh, this is just right. This is the right amount of, of stretch for a maximum tension muscle contraction. All right, in a muscle contraction, we, we can look at a graph. Here's the graph. I'll come back to it. When we look at these graphs, we're going to look at latent period. Why is there a latent period? I'll talk about that. And then we're going to look at the contraction period. That's when you make the peak in the graph. And then we're going to look at the relaxation phase. And that's when the graph falls back down to the resting state. So latent, contraction, and relaxation. Here it is. All right. Well, my stimulus is applied at this green arrow times zero. But notice my, my graph doesn't jump up immediately. So this period right here is called my latent period. Well, what's going on there? Well, think about this. First of all, the neurotransmitters got to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind the receptors and open cation channels. Secondly, calcium has to flood out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then go bind to the, the troponin and pull the tropomyosin away from the myosin head binding sites. So that takes time. No, it doesn't take a, a lot of time. We're talking milliseconds, all right? And in fact, it looks like it's about maybe two and a half milliseconds, right? This is in milliseconds. So my latent period is pretty short, but there's still a latent period. And now the contraction phase here is when the calcium has dragged the, has bound to the troponin and dragged the trop, made the troponin change shape and dragged the tropomyosin out of the way. So that's my contraction phase. And then my relaxation phase, after I, after I hit my maximum tension, and actually it doesn't have to be maximum tension for that sarcomere, but in this case we're saying it's maximum tension. And uh, I was just thinking, forgive me. All right, so then what happens here is the calcium is being pumped back into the SR. So calcium is going back into the SR and therefore not binding the troponin, and the tropomyosin slides back over the myosin head binding sites. All right, so that's a, that's a muscle twitch. All right, that's a single twitch. We'll come back to that twitch because we're going to talk about twitches in a little bit. Actually, right now. As it turns out, some muscles twitch faster than others, and you can see the soleus here has quite a slow twitch. Matter of fact, the soleus twitch starts, 
everything starts at zero. The soleus takes 100 milliseconds to go through the whole cycle. That means to have the latent phase, the contraction phase, and the relaxation phase. And you can see its contraction phase runs from runs from about oh, 2.5 to about, I don't know, 42 or 43, something like that. Now that's the soleus. Well, look at another muscle. Look at the gastrocnemius. Look how much faster that twitch is. It goes through the whole cycle in 40 milliseconds versus 100. So it takes less than half the time as the soleus. Well, look at one of the eye muscles. That even is a faster twitcher than the gastrocnemius. So these are twitches. And because of these twitches, we have muscles we call fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. So the soleus would be a slow twitch muscle. And the gastrocnemius and some of the muscles of the eye would be fast twitch muscles. This is why we classify them that way, based on how much time it takes to go through a twitch. All right. Now, given these twitches, we have different types of tension production in our muscle contraction. Now, this is called trepe right here. And what happens is you have a, a twitch that's submaximal tension and it relaxes. And here's another twitch that's submaximal tension, but it completely relaxes. And then you have another one and it's submaximal, but a little bit higher than the previous one, but it completely relaxes. And the biggest thing here to differentiate trepe from other types of, of, of tension production is this. You, the Myofibers are completely relaxing in between twitches. So they're completely relaxing and coming to zero. But each successive twitch is a, has a slightly more tension than the previous one. So it staircases. It's like a staircase. In fact, that's what I think trepe means. So what's the reason for this? Well, the reason for this is progressively increasing calcium concentrations. And why would that be? Because you did completely relax, but you sent another signal before all the calcium was pumped back into the SR. So that's why we get increasing tension from, from these uh, uh, twitches. Now, this is maximum tension for these myofibers in trepe, this dotted line. This is maximum tension for these myofibers and trepe. But that's not the maximum tension of the entire organ by any means. The maximum tension of the entire organ is right here, and it's called tetanus. Okay, we're going to approach that maximum tension of the entire organ shortly. All right, this is called wave summation. And this is when you don't completely relax the myofibers in between signals or in between stimuli. So this is why it's different from trepe, because you're not completely relaxing. And you can see that right here. You can see that I applied the signal and I twitched, but I didn't completely relax and I applied the signal and I twitched. So you're gonna say, well, that sounds like it's increasing calcium concentration in, in the sarcoplasm. And I would agree with you. But also what it is, is the sarcomere shortened and didn't and never completely lengthened. Sarcomere shortened, and then during the partial relaxation, they didn't completely lengthen or go back to the resting state. So they're more likely to hit an optimum stretch in there and have a lot of cross bridges formed so what I have is summing my individual twitches it's called wave summation you the big thing here is you don't allow the myofibers to relax in between stimuli and, and when I say you don't allow it how would you keep them from doing that you send the stimulus quicker so you tell your muscle to contract and before it relaxes you tell the muscle to contract again you send the stimulus a little bit quicker Now this is wave summation up to incomplete tetanus. Now what is incomplete tetanus? Well, first of all, it's submaximal still. There's maximal. And you're getting some relaxation 
There's some relaxation. There's some relaxation. There's some relaxation. Are you getting complete relaxation? Absolutely not. You're getting some relaxation. They're brief, but they're there. That's how that's different from tetanus, because with complete tetanus, what I have is no relaxation. So this is the maximum tension I can produce in that muscle, and I don't allow a relaxation after I hit it. Now, there's physiological tetanus and there's pathological tetanus. We're not talking about pathological tetanus here. All right, pathological tetanus is caused by a toxin from Clostridium tetani, a bacteria, and that's bad. But this is physiological tetanus, and this is the maximum muscle contraction you can have and hold it for a period of time. Now, what do you mean hold it for a period of time? Well, I don't care how much you tell yourself to keep holding this tetanic contraction. Right here, when you have no ATP, your muscle is going to relax. Well, actually, you know, you, you know what you really have. What you really have is you have one more round of ATP to... to uh, to make your myosin heads release and then hydrolyze and cock, but then you're done. You have no more energy to contract that muscle again. So that's why you're gonna you're gonna relax this muscle. Uh, let me see what else on complete tetanus. All right, so that's complete tetanus. That's the maximum contraction you can have. Now, what am I talking about? A myofiber. A, um, a muscle organ well somewhere in the middle and what I mean by that is I've been avoiding this conversation until we get there but a myofiber is all or nothing either it contracts or doesn't contract now that's not to say that you can't have trepe with a myofiber you certainly can have trepe with a myofiber in fact here's trepe with a myofiber see it contracted and it relaxed that was all or nothing and then you, you send it another signal, and it contracted and relaxed. And the signal was fast enough where all the calcium wasn't pump, pumped back into the SR. So the next signal, you already had some calcium in the cytoplasm. So then when you sent that signal, you bound more calcium, bound more troponin, which pulled, more tro which pulled the tropomyosin out of the way. And you actually had more cross bridge form, and it contracted a little, a, a little stronger. And then you relaxed. But still, you sent the signal before you could pump all the calcium back into the SR, so the next signal was a little stronger, and a little stronger, and a little stronger until you hit maximum trepe, maximum tension for trepe for that myofiber. Now, so why am I always talking about a myofiber? Could this, couldn't these be more than a myofiber? And the answer is yes. In fact, this is more than a myofiber. 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 Well, what the heck is it then? It's actually a motor unit. Because what happens is you don't have one nerve per one myofiber. That's the smallest you can get. One nerve, one myofiber. A one-to-one -one ratio. But typically you have one nerve in, in lots of myofibers. Hundreds of them sometimes. So the all of the myofibers that one motor neuron innervates is called a motor unit. So whatever a motor neuron does to one myofiber, it does to all the myofibers within that motor unit. So really what I'm talking about here on these tension productions are motor units. That's really what I'm talking about. This is showing you a motor unit. The purple motor neuron right here, purple, goes down and hits the purple uh, myofibers. So those myofibers, those purple myofibers are going are gonna to all contract together when that purple motor neuron fires. Now that purple motor neuron is going to fire and it, even if it hits, and it's going to hit tetanus and it's going to suffer from fatigue and it's not going to be able to fire anymore for a little while. No problem if I have to keep lifting that weight. My purple motor neuron can pause firing. My purple myofibers can rest and make ATP. And my blue motor neuron can fire. And my blue myofibers making up the blue motor unit can take over. And after the blue motor unit's done, then the, whatever this color is to you, the, um, I don't know what that color would be. I'm sorry, but I don't. 
orange. <laughs> I'm trying to think what color to call that, whatever color you would call that. So you can see that different motor units can take over at any given time. Now look at the tension in the tendon. Does the tension in the tendon drop off when you switch over from motor units? Yeah, a little bit. You can see that right here. But for the most part, the tension in my tendon stays relatively constant. So as my muscle fatigues and I do motor unit recruitment, meaning I let one motor unit rest while the other one takes over, and I let that one rest while a third one takes over, and so on and so forth, I keep the tension in my tendon relatively constant. I might have a little, some minor fluctuations. Hopefully it's not enough to drop the load, the weight. Obviously that's the whole purpose here. I have a contraction going on, I'm lifting a load or lifting a weight, and I apparently don't want to drop it for some reason. Maybe it's eggs or milk or something like that, and I don't want to drop it and break it. So there you go with the tension in the tendon. It's relatively constant as I switch from motor unit to motor unit. There's different types of uh, tension production based on how the load moves. And sometimes we call the load resistance. So, by the way, let's, let's name these things. First of all, the muscle is called the effort. And the load is called load or resistance. Some people call it resistance. Whoops, can't spell. Resistance. And I have three different types of movements. Three different types of tension production classified based on the movement of the load or the, or the resistance. And it goes like this. If I have, if my, my load or resistance moves, I have an isotonic contraction. If my load or resistance doesn't move, I have an isometric contraction. So I can contract a muscle and the, and the load or resistance doesn't move. Think of trying to curl a weight that's too heavy for you. You can strain and start sweating and try to contract your biceps brachii, but you really can't curl that weight. Or just think of pushing on a wall. You know, you go up to the wall in the, in the college someplace and you start pushing on the wall. It's not going to fall down. But you can push and push and push and strain and sweat. And you're expending a lot of energy. But the load isn't moving. So if the load isn't moving, it's called an isometric contraction. If the load is moving, it's called an isotonic contraction. But there actually is two types of isotonic contractions. Because it, it says the length of the muscle changes. But it doesn't say it has to get shorter. All right. So there's two types of isotonic contractions. There's concentric contractions and that's when your muscle gets shorter and there's eccentric contractions and that's when you're contracting your muscle but the muscle gets longer now I'll just give you an example of that might as well give you an example here's a bar here's a guy he's doing chin-ups all right so he pulls himself up Pulls himself up, his chin's over the bar, and now he holds himself here. He holds this. Well, as you know, because you've done chin-ups before, he can't hold it forever. He can hold it there as long as he can hold it there, but it's not going to be forever. Eventually, he's going to start, his chin's going to go below the bar, and his arms are going to start to straighten. But if he resists that movement all the way down, then he's contracting his muscle but the muscle's lengthening, and that's an eccentric contraction. Whereas the concentric contraction is going from hanging down to chinning up. So chinning up is a concentric contraction. You're shortening the muscle and lifting the load. But an eccentric contraction is contracting the muscle, but length, or contracting your myofibers, but lengthening the muscle. So you can see the difference between concentric and eccentric there. This is showing you concentric you can see that I produce a tension. I went from muscle tension from zero to two kilograms. That's my muscle tension, all right? And then look at the length of my muscle. 
it went from a hundred uh, percent length. It's not. It's it's in percentage. It's not in millimeters or centimeters or anything. To seventy percent length. So my muscle got shorter. So this is definitely concentric. If my muscle got shorter, then it's a concentric contraction. I produced tension and my muscle got shorter. Look at this one. This one's eccentric contraction because I produced tension right here. But my muscle got longer. It went from whatever the 100% resting length is to a longer length. Now, the chin-up wouldn't be a good example for that now, would it? Because how do you go longer than straight arms? And I agree with you. But there's some muscles that could be stretched beyond rest. And if they're producing tension when they do that, then, then you could see that to go above 100% resting length. So that's an eccentric contraction. And then this is isometric because the load is not moving. You're certainly producing tension, but the length remains unchanged. You can see the length of the muscle is unchanged. Make sure you know those three types of contractions, concentric, eccentric, and isometric. This is the collage for you showing you the three. All right. Well, what we do with, when we uh, lift loads, like a small load, intermediate load, or large load, well, first one thing we do is we recruit more motor units if it's a real heavy load and we have to lift it. And the other thing is this. Look at the the time it takes to shorten that distance. All right. So if you look at a small load right here, small load, and you look right, just let's just compare right here all the way down. It took 40 milliseconds to to uh, shorten this much distance. Let's just call this 100. All right. So it took me 40 milliseconds to move 100 millimeters. 40 milliseconds for 100 millimeters. Now look at a large load. It took me 30, say 32. 32 milliseconds to only move 10 millimeters. So a far, far more weight and just about the same amount of time to, to move it. But I, I went a far less distance. So this is when I'm lifting a large load. I don't move, in other words, here's another way of saying it. Lar I can't move large loads as far in the same period of time. And that should make sense. Think about just curling a weight on the, at the end of your arm. You, have, you put a light weight at the end of your arm. You can curl it completely up to your shoulder and back down, and you can do it qu relatively quickly. Now, put a real heavy weight on there. If you only allow yourself to contract for the same period of time that you did the light weight, you're not going to get it all the way up. So if you keep the time constant, the distance will be different. If you keep the distance con constant, the time will be different. So it all depends on what you're comparing, time or distance. This is, and this is a graph of both time and distance. So this is moving small loads and moving large loads. And that's it. Now, coming back, we're going to talk about the energy source of muscles, and we'll start talking about these slow twitch and fast twitch muscles some more. Because that tension production part of it was just the beginning. Now we're going to build on the tension production and talk about power movements and endurance movements and where's the energy coming from and things like that. Talk to you in a bit.